Now, for 17 years, Francis Coppola worked in banking, specializing in financial risk management. Now, today, she writes about banks, financing, and economics in general at Coppola Comment. That's a regular feature on the Financial Times' Alpha blog, Alpha Bill blog, rather, Alpha Bill. Now, she is also associate editor of the online magazine Pieria and a frequent commentator on financial matters for the BBC. Now, we wanted to get her understanding of money creation and the private sector, and I first started by asking her what she thought about endogenous money and how it is created. Take a look at what she had to say. I think it's a question of what comes first. I mean, what we know is that banks can lend or shall we say they can make loan agreements without actually having funds. What the funds they need is to settle a deposit withdrawal. What they do when they lend is they create a deposit which the customer then withdraws and makes it to pay whoever he's, um, say he wants to build a house extension or something like that, um, which he, he withdraws that deposit to pay his builder. Um, the banks have to have funds to settle that payment, but at the time the loan is agree agreed, they don't have to have actual funds um, because they will create the deposit. Um, that's the nature of endogenous money. So the way we can regard it is the loan agreement comes first creates a deposit, but then banks have to find funds to settle the withdrawal of that deposit. That's how it works. Now, now back to what Krugman said, you know, after a month of being silent on this issue, he finally made a blanket dismissal of the paper's importance on his blog. This is where he made the dismissal. Now, what do you make of Krugman's dismissal? Well, Krugman is a traditional macroeconomist. He's looking at it from his point of view. Um, he's looking at I think sometimes you have to distinguish between what the banking system as a whole does and what individual banks do. What Krugman's basically saying is the banking system as a whole operates like that. It lends and then it funds. Um, but individual banks don't. I disagree with him. I think banks too lend and then fund. And I say that as somebody who worked in banks and actually sees, saw how this works in practice. Um, it's true that banks at the end of the day can only lend funding, only um, pay out money they've got, but that doesn't mean they have to have it at the time that they lend. So I actually don't agree with Krugman on that. FT columnist Martin Wolf, he certainly does get it. Uh, pointing to the Bank of England video, he says deposits that banks created as a byproduct of their lending make up 97% of the UK money supply. But he's so uncomfortable with this that he says that we should strip private banks of their power to create money and leave that in the hands of the state. Now, what do you think of Wolf's proposal? I actually disagree with it. Um, I, I, Whatever you may say about banks' power to create money, at least they are responding to some extent to demand for lending. Now, I know we have a debate about whether banks actually create that demand for lending by pushing down interest rates and encouraging, lend encouraging people to borrow. But they are responding to a demand for money, for lending. Um, if you replace that with a committee trying to de decide in advance on the basis of imperfect information how much money the economy needs, it sounds like a recipe for disaster to me. Now, I want to move on. The ECB has been under a lot of scrutiny given the receding inflation figures in the Eurozone. So do you think they'll start QE? No, I don't. I think they'll talk about it endlessly and they'll talk about all manner of things. But I think the legal difficulties and the relationships among states in the Eurozone are not good enough, really, for them to be able to, to proceed with a, a traditional QE programme. I think it creates very grave difficulties, really, um, if they proceed on a weighted, weighted basket basis where they're you know, buying assets based upon the contribution to the euro system, then they are uh, potentially creating synthetic euro bonds and pooling debt, which the Germany opposes. Um, if they proceed on a buy asset, buy certain um, rate triple-A rated securities only, then they're arguably giving a subsidy to the German government. Why? So I, I think the difficulties with it are just fraught. Now, while you don't think that the ECB should go forward with this, what kind of assets should the ECB buy if they were to go forward with this hypothetically? Um, one thing that they could look at is rather than QE, so monetary easing, is credit easing because unlike the United States, Europe, Europe's businesses are very dependent on bank lending. They use the capital markets much less 
and they use banks far more for financing. Mm -hmm. And Eurozone's banks are a bit of a mess, really, and they aren't lending to businesses the way they should be at all, and certainly not in the periphery. So one of the things that Eurozone, the ECB could consider doing is trying to encourage bank lending by, for example, going down the Bank of England's route and providing cheap funds to banks. Um, they've also been discussing um, potentially expanding the securitization of um, uh, uh, bank loans to small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, there's not much of a market for those at the moment, and the ones we have got tend to be already pledged to the ECB as collateral anyway. But if they could manage to encourage banks to securitize far more of them, do more lending to small businesses and securitize them, then the ECB is basically saying it would be quite happy to buy them. And that might be a good stimulus both for lending and for the businesses themselves. Now, like you said, the European banking system has not securitized its loan books to the degree that American banks have. So the value of assets available for purchase outside of government bonds is low enough that the ECB's purchase of them will really have a big effect on asset prices. So are you at all concerned that this could cause distortions? It's possible. I mean, but then the ECB already has a lot of stuff pledged to it that not too many other <laughs> central huh. banks will accept. I mean, the Fed historically has been far tighter with its range of eligible collateral than the ECB. Um, so the, the, the question really is whether you, when you move on from simply pledging your collateral to actually owning it, um, that just might be a, a, a step too far for some of the northern um, states to accept, really. Now, if the ECB buys government bonds, won't that be a case of monetizing debt and financing deficits, which is against Article 123? They say not. And I know I've argued in the past that even the OMT, for example, um, was done to preserve the euro, or proposed to preserve the euro, not to um, bail out Italy or Spain. Um, the problem is that that has been challenged. Um, the Constitutional Court in Germany has already said, as far as it's concerned, it's illegal. It's referred it to the European um, Court of Justice. We'll have to see what that does. So um, the specific bailout of certain countries by monetizing their debt is apparently not acceptable. QE is slightly different in that it's um, not looking at specific countries, it's looking at the Eurozone as a whole. The problem you've got is it hasn't got pooled debt, so you have to try and create something that looks like full debt and that may not be acceptable to Germany either. I do think we are going to trip over this question of debt monetization if we attempt QE. That was the always lovely Francis Coppola. Time now for today's big deal. time with Edward Harrison and today we're talking about Bitcoin and the US government's concern with the dark side of the interweb the interweb okay now the Department of Defense's combating terrorism technical support office or C TTSO which is also a long acronym was soliciting proposals for understanding how virtual currencies could finance threats against the United States now although every Bitcoin transaction is public the parties involved in those transactions remain anonymous which of course can facilitate illicit activity now the CTTSO described the perceived dangers of virtual currency saying quote the introduction of virtual currencies will likely shape threat finance by increasing the opaqueness, transactional velocity, and overall efficiencies of terrorist attacks. Pretty intense words. So, Ed, can you tell me about uh, the...